Oakwood Cemetery has been really one of my favorite places in Syracuse since I moved here in the, the late 1990s. And, you know, as one of the co-directors of the Center for Cultural Landscape Preservation, along with Rachel and George, um, Oakwood has really been, you know, a place of inspiration for us and, and a lab for looking at issues of, of landscape preservation. So, and actually until recently, my office overlooked Oakwood Cemetery for Marshall Hall. So really happy to be here this evening to talk about Oakwood. Uh, Rachel? Yes, thank you. So hi, uh, my name is Rachel Leibowitz and I'm John's colleague in our Center for Cultural Landscape Preservation. I'm an assistant professor here in the Department of Landscape Architecture at SUNY ESF. Um, and I arrived here in the fall of 2018. That was my first semester here. Before that, um, I practiced for 15 years thereabouts in the field of historic preservation and public history. Um, most recently uh, as the Deputy State Historic Preservation Officer for the state of Illinois. And so welcome, we look forward to sharing this uh, with you. Um, John, I don't know if you wanna get the slides started, but great. And so, um, so this evening, uh, we'll be taking a brief look at Oakwood Cemetery's landmark designations, which date back to the early 1990s, when efforts to preserve this historic cemetery, including uh, the founding of the Historic Oakwood Cemetery Preservation Association, or HOCPOP, these efforts were just getting underway. And so why do we need to look at these landmark designations? Well, on the one hand, you know, we landmark things to document their history, their significance. Um, and so in this case, why should we preserve this historic cemetery? We're documenting its, uh, its design, its site. Um, many public and private uh, preservation programs use federal and state designations. So the New York State Register of Historic Places and the National Register of Historic Places, they use them as gateways um, to uh, apply for grants, um, and historic preservation tax credits. So the local landmark law in Syracuse does the work of regulating changes to historic resources in Oakwood Cemetery in line with other land use powers that local municipalities hold. And while Oakwood is the property of Oakwood Cemeteries Incorporated, a private nonprofit corporation, the federal, state, and local landmark designations reflect a substantial public interest in the cemetery. These laws and programs are also essential management tools meant to foster Oakwood's preservation for future generations. Being aware of these designations is important for all those who own, care for, or use Oakwood Cemetery, including the SF Friends of Oakwood and the cemetery's many friends and neighbors. So before we get into the specifics of Oakwood's landmark designations, I'd first like to take a brief look at what we mean when we say historic preservation, because um, I think people too often think of it as something where the goal is to freeze time and stop change. And that's not the case. Historic preservation is actually about recognizing the historic significance of places in our environment and then planning for their continued viability in our everyday lives. And preservation is not limited to individual buildings. It's about conserving, or a better word might even be maintaining historic places. And so this series of US postal stamps, which is from 1971, we think is a, is a fun example, a great example of the variety of preservation from individual buildings, such as Decatur House in Washington in the upper left, to the uh, San Francisco cable car system, streetcars uh, at the lower left, and a ship, and the uh, Spanish colonial mission of San Javier del Bac near Tucson, Arizona, which is also located within the territory of the Tohono O'odham Nation. None of the stamps shows a historic feature, a historic resource in isolation, but rather as part of a larger landscape. And so, um, the stamps are unusual in their emphasis of two vehicles, the streetcar, cable car, and a ship. Um, that's a little bit less common. 
um, and isolated objects of art or sculpture also are rather rarely listed in the National Register of Historic Places. The National Register of Historic Places was organized primarily to focus on these four types of historic resources, buildings, districts, structures, and sites. So a district, a historic district is a collection of buildings, but also the spaces in between them. It's what knits them together, right? Um, structures are often a bridge um, or a road system. Um, it could be even part of the streetcar system. It could be a structure, um, transportation corridors. Um, sites typically are uh, referring to archeological sites typically, but sometimes they can be landscapes. But in order to be considered as historic, they have to be able to tell us today something significant about the past. And so one thing I want you to notice here with this is that landscape is not included here as a type of resource. And so we might call some landscapes districts and others we might call them sites and that can be confusing. Um, but so again, as I said, site is often used for archeology span and archeology span is different from all of these resource types here. Um, if I could have the next slide. So um, archeology span and no offense, I mean none to any archeologists who may be watching this, but just so everyone at home knows archeology span is a destructive practice, right? Um, in the course of their work, highly skilled, trained archeologists, they're excavating very carefully and they're recording very methodically what they find and collect, but in doing so, they destroy the site. They destroy that place. And so to be listed in the National Register of Historic Places, a site needs to be for the most part unexcavated and preserved in place to the greatest extent possible. And so archeological sites are listed in the National Register of Historic Places for the information that they likely contain and what they could tell us about our history and that place at some point in the future, but preserving it in place. And so I just wanted to give you this slide so you could see um, a wide variety of things that might be considered archeological sites, whether the World Heritage Site of Cahokia Mounds, um, back in my home state of Illinois, archeologists working in the field, um, a barn, uh, that may have been um, utilized as shelter during the uh, Trail of Tears, um, the Cherokee movement, um, uh, the forced relocation in the 19th century, and then even a rural cemetery, an abandoned uh, cemetery on a farm uh, property or other private property also might be considered to be archeology. span At its core, I think historic preservation is really about thinking ahead to future generations. So what will our children value in our environment? Or what do we wish past generations have preserved and adaptively reused? I like to think about Archibald Stadium that opened in 1907 on the SU campus, looking here from Irving Avenue. Um, and as you know, in the late, may know in the late 1970s, the university decided it needed to be replaced uh, with the dome which is now being called the stadium again. And this is looking from the same direction from uh, Irving Avenue. So, you know, today perhaps the old stadium would have been saved and the new dome built on ample vacant land nearby, who knows? But these are the kinds of decisions when we're thinking about preserving places that we really want to project ahead to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, um, just thinking about uh, elsewhere on our campus with the Department of Landscape Architecture, our own um, Marshall Hall. Um, you know, like we said uh, earlier, that historic preservation isn't really about freezing things in time necessarily. It's about managing, maintaining living places and making informed choices. So um, Marshall Hall, the home of the Department of Landscape Architecture is currently undergoing um, a renovation to its historic building. Um, I believe the last time that the building was renovated, maybe it was 1968 or, or thereabouts, something like that. And so um, the current rehabilitation project is going to make this building a, an amazing and a, be a beautiful 21st century learning facility, but it's also going to preserve its, its most important character defining features, such as in the interior, this curving central staircase, 
um, and some other significant public spaces, auditorium spaces. It's going to uncover and return uh, to use the old skylights that you can see in this image here, which um, have been uh, blocked or covered up from the interior, uh, the interior spaces. So the studios uh, on that top floor will now be light filled and be wonderful places for students to work. And as you can see in this image uh, here, um, now the accessible entrance to the building and the elevator is hidden on the rear of the building. And so you can kind of see superimposed on this um, older image, there will be a new accessible entrance on the side of the building um, that will be constructed. It will be more prominent, but it will be designed in a more compatible way. This is just a massing study to show where its location will be. Um, and so how large should it be? Where exactly should it be located on the building? This is the kind of work that can be done to make historic buildings more current. So um, just to move ahead to Oakwood, here we are. Archibald Stadium at the uh, SU campus, Marshall Hall on the ESF campus, they are buildings. Landscapes such as Oakwood Cemetery require a different approach to historic preservation. And so preserving a place uh, like Oakwood is a very complicated task because of its sheer size, its diversity of landscape features from its circulation and its spaces, spaces dedicated for particular activities, to its buildings, to its objects, its monuments, its artworks, and the incorporation of natural features that are always changing. And so because of these issues with landscapes, it wasn't until the 80s, 1980s, that the National Park Service began to work out the methods for how to preserve a landscape. And as with any historic property, one of the keys to successful preservation of Oakwood Cemetery is understanding its uh, history and its significance and then really appreciating them. So as you may have heard from prior uh, presentations in this series, either by George Curry or uh, our last speaker, David Sloan, some of the significant historic characteristics of Oakwood Cemetery were its informal system of roads and its trees, both visible in this photograph from prior to uh, the construction of Interstate 81. Uh, the designer of Oakwood Cemetery, Howard Daniels, carefully laid out the landscape around the rolling topography. And he designed it to be approached from the main gate, which is indicated by the arrow off to the lower uh, uh, right, um, and then proceeding through a transitional zone until reaching the burial plots. So today, um, many of Oakwood's key, these key characteristics remain but some have lost their historic character. For example, many trees have been re removed. Some roads are eroded or covered by grass. Buildings have been abandoned and the original gate is blocked by 81. Um, the highway, as David Sloan told in our last lecture, changed the way people experienced Oakwood Cemetery and broke its direct connection to the core of Syracuse, transforming the cemetery from an integral part of Syracuse's civic realm into a more isolated, private, and inward looking place. This is just some of the history and existing conditions issues that are necessary to know in order to be good stewards of this historic landscape. And it's a type of information contained in Oakwood's National Register listing, which Rachel will now share with you. Yeah, so just to get started on, on the National Register of Historic Places, what does that mean? Oakwood Cemetery is listed in the National Register of Historic Places. Uh, the National Register is an official list um, that is part of the federal government's official historic preservation program. And this program, this nationwide federal program was established by the National Historic Preservation Act of 1966. And so um, if we could have the next slide. Uh, the National Register comes out of that law, the National Historic Preservation Act of 1966, uh, saying, you know, we have to understand what we have in order to make informed decisions about how best to protect what we have. And so uh, I think that this is worth reading in full. It comes directly from the act. Um, but we need to concern ourselves with the spirit and direction of the nation 
which is founded upon and reflected in its historic heritage. The historic and cultural foundations of the nation should be preserved as a living part of our community life and development in order to give a sense of orientation to the American people. Our built environment is who we are, is what this is saying in part. I think that's pretty important. And the preservation of this irreplaceable heritage is in the public interest so that its vital legacy of cultural, educational, aesthetic, inspirational, economic, and energy benefits will be maintained and enriched for future generations of Americans. So again, not necessarily thinking um, about this moment and freezing this moment, but that it is trying to um, share history uh, across time, basically. So if I could have the next slide, um, the act, of 1966 was passed in response to the tremendous loss of historic cultural resources due to um, post-war, that's after World War II, the federal highway construction programs, vast construction programs, and then also uh, urban renewal agendas. And so here in Syracuse, Interstate 81 was built in the early 1960s before the National Historic Preservation Act uh, was passed in 1966. We didn't have this law. So there was no assessment of what uh, the highway project's effects on Oakwood Cemetery might be, even though at the time, Oakwood was already over 100 years old. And so here you can see that entrance gate um, from uh, the arrow in a prior photo there and it is completely closed off by Interstate 81 today. So um, uh, the National Register is um, one of the programs of the National Historic Preservation Act of 1966. Um, I wanna show you on this map here. Um, this is from the state of New York's cultural resources uh, GIS mapping system. They call it CRIS or CRIS. Um, the shaded areas um, are national register listed uh, or state register listed uh, districts. Um, and then the things that are not colored shaded but are outlined are identified as eligible properties or districts, eligible but not listed. So um, uh, the national register is part of this program, as I said, 1966. It is the nation's official list of historic properties worthy of preservation. Uh, being listed in the National Register is an honorary designation, honorary, honorific. There are no restrictions placed on private owners of registered properties. So private property owners may sell or alter or dispose of their property as they wish. Um, registered properties and properties that are determined to be eligible for listing in the registers can receive a measure of protection from the effects of federal or state agency sponsored, licensed or assisted projects through a notice, review and consultation process. And owners of depreciable certified historic properties may take a 20% federal income tax credit for the costs of substantial rehabilitation under the Tax Reform Act of 1986, and municipal, so public owners and not-for-profit owners of listed historic properties may apply for matching state historic preservation grants. So those are actually some of the benefits of being listed in the National Register of Historic Places or in the State Register, which we have here in New York. So could I have the next slide? So how do places qualify for listing in the National Register. Well, first, a place has to be uh, historically significant. Um, so staff at the State Historic Preservation Office, along with municipalities, individual property owners, private property owners, community groups, um, have identified a site as being historically significant um, and, and they want to nominate it. So uh, they have to decide if it, uh, illustrates events or developments, activities that are important in our social history. And it could be at the local level or the state or national level. And so we call these areas of significance. And interestingly, most of the places listed in the National Register of Historic Places are actually listed at the local 
level of significance. And so here you can see two very different kinds of landscape properties in New York that are um, listed uh, in the National Register. Can I have the next slide, please? And so here uh, in, in Syracuse, actually, here are two other really interesting properties, the Gustav Stickley House, and then our own Thorndon Park here in Syracuse. So they also are not only historically significant, they could be significant works of art, architecture, landscape architecture, or engineering. And so we would consider these areas of significance to be not just social, but cultural, because they relate to design or to the arts. But of course, I, I believe that they're social too, because the arts and culture, they don't exist in a vacuum. They respond to issues of technology and commerce and government and planning. May I have the next slide, please? So the second thing, in addition to its significance, cultural or social, should be that a property has to retain good physical integrity. And that's subjective. These are subjective things. Um, but uh, integrity that is related to its historic period of significance. When did these historic events happen in the past? So that is to say, does this place convey its historic significance through its physical features? Does it look like it did back then, as we say? So here's a Woolworths building here in Syracuse. I would say, yes, I think that's eligible for listing. Um, and would be a great tax uh, credit, you know, a great rehabilitation project. But somebody else might say, oh, the cornice is missing. And, you know, there's just too much stuff missing for it to be individually uh, eligible, but as a district, sure. So again, there can be some subjectivity to this. And that's why these con uh, conversations and consultation is so important, I think. Can I have the next slide? So, um, this I think is really interesting. This is the Barnes Hiscock mansion here in Syracuse. And so here we can look and say, well, what, what do we have here? On the left, we have a historic image of what it used to be. The Barnes Hiscock mansion is listed in the National Register of Historic Places, but only the building. So the landscapes and the grounds um, are considered to be non-contributing features. So it's almost like the, the building is just like a spaceship with no context, no sight. The site, um, the beautiful gardens that once were there are currently, um, there's some evidence of them, but we have a student uh, working with John Alwater um, to uh, do some uh, field work and archival research. That's where these images, uh, the image on the left came from, but you can see today how the site is actually quite altered um, around this historic mansion. Um, and so we said earlier that uh, the National Register of Historic Places really wasn't organized to deal with landscapes. And uh, they really didn't start thinking about them until the 1980s. This publication, which you can find online, the link there is below. Um, this is a National Park Service publication and uh, written by uh, their um, landscape historian or one of their National Register staff who specializes in landscape, Barbara Wyatt. Um, and she wrote that it was 15 years after this act of 1966 was passed that cultural landscapes were first recognized by the Park Service. So not until 1981 did they say, wow, we really need to be thinking about landscape and, and the built environment in a more holistic way and not just focus on buildings and structures uh, without context. So um, as I said, the National Register not equipped to deal with landscapes. It's created for these other things, buildings, structures, objects, and districts, um, archeological sites. So down uh, on the right bottom where I have it highlighted, a little arrow there, it suggests if you have a small park with a fountain, you could list it as a site. That's what it's recommending. So if I could have the next slide. But if you look at this slide, it's also saying, oh, um, there are all types of, of of sites that could be uh, nominated as sites, rock formations, um, designed landscapes, cemeteries, huh? And they could be sites. Um, districts would be larger, a college campus with a quad, um, civic centers, rural villages, canal systems. So whether they're talking about a certain sense of scale, there are different ways in which landscapes can be accommodated in the National Register, but to me, as, as, a, as uh, someone 
coming from state historic preservation uh, offices, I feel like this is a little difficult. Um, it feels to me like almost like Cinderella's stepsisters trying to jam their feet into the glass slipper and insist that landscapes fit in these categories and being like, no, 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 it's great. Trust me, it's great. And um, I'm, not, I'm not sure. I wish that the Park Service might consider um, uh, thinking about the regulations to accommodate landscapes um, in, in, a, in a more exact way. So that's what I would hope for in the future. If I could have the next slide. Um, so these National Register bulletins are, are there not only to tell you how you might go about nominating a property for listing, but also how to amend and update a nomination for a property that's already listed. And so I might suggest here that that's something that could be done for Oakwood Cemetery. Um, and frankly, for a lot of other properties that are listed here in Syracuse because their nominations may be old um, and they may have new areas of historic significance, um, stories that weren't told in the past that um, now maybe we should be including those stories, those histories, or maybe we want to expand the period of significance to um, be more uh, into the recent past. For example, here, the Oakwood nomination um, stops in 1940. I believe the period of significance ends in 1940. If we, not, if we amended um, the Oakwood Cemetery uh, nomination, we could propose as an example that maybe its period of significance should go all the way up to the construction of Interstate 81. It's just a thought. So um, here's the first page of that nomination. Um, you can see that the areas of significance are quite limited. Um, they uh, have chosen um, no criterion A at all. Um, only the box for C is checked and that means design. That means um, no social history. It's just uh, 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 for its, its landscape design, its garden design and the design of its monuments and sculptures, the beauty of that. Um, so you could check the box for A to include areas of social history, community uh, development, planning, recreation because it was a city park or it's functioned in a way as a city park before Syracuse had a more expansive park system. So section seven of the National Register nomination, which you see on the left, I think, um, states that this is a, a cemetery or a funerary function that I understand, but it also has a landscape function. And again, I'd ask, what is a landscape function? It functions as a landscape. So is it a park? for recreation? Is it there for its aesthetic qualities? It's for, uh, it, it came into existence um, out of local planning decisions. So um, again, uh, its, its function is a landscape and yet there's no category for landscape. Uh, you can see this property is uh, listed as a district and not a landscape. Um, it lists materials as stone, as stone, um, and uh, I would think that you could amend it to list all these other plant materials. Um, so again, I might, I might suggest that as well. Oak um, trees. <laughs> yeah, oak trees, exactly, exactly. I mean, that's where Oakwood gets its name, gets its name. So um, section eight at the bottom, statement of significance. Um, uh, again, we could amend it and add all these other important uh, criteria and social histories. So I'm sorry, John, please go forward. Um, so uh, I believe here, do we have this inventory slide? Yes. So the inventory then also could be updated um, to consider um, non-contributing resources and not just contributing resources. Um, so that could be another way that it's amended um, and could also talk about um, current conditions or provide some more details. And the next one with the map. Um, so I believe this map again, which is part of the nomination, um, we could also uh, provide um, a better map. Um, this includes the uh, historic, uh, John, I don't know if your cursor can show that historic outline and then um, later additions um, that exist. Yeah, through 1940. 
So that would also be another great thing to do um, because we know that there are many beautiful maps and, um, and uh, they've been produced, they could be added to this. But so what does being listed in the National Register really mean for Oakwood? So in this case, um, like I said, it's an honorific designation. It does not compel the owner to do anything in particular with this historic landscape or the roads or objects within it. Um, so one thing that it really did do, which is wonderful, is it provided a great level of important documentation and research that's produced. Um, but again, it could perhaps be updated or revised or amended, but it is largely an honor. Um, and so um, one thing that uh, it, it can do, um, right now here in Syracuse, uh, we are discussing the future of Interstate uh, 81. And so uh, federal law, um, also part of that National Historic Preservation Act of 1966 uh, includes section 106 of the act, which requires review of impacts to cultural resources, historic resources, by anything that receives federal funding or requires um, federal permits or licenses. And so this project does. So they need to consider its impacts to um, uh, certainly its immediate environs in the uh, right of way, but also within a certain distance on either side of the right of way. And um, if, if the community grid option is selected, then, um, where this reconstruction project takes place, um, as it nears that cemetery gate that is closed, um, then perhaps there can be uh, additional conversations about what occurs there at that place where 81 may um, touch the ground near the cemetery gate. And so that's the federal law. There is a similar state law here in New York um, so the uh, New York State Historic Preservation Law of 1980, which is called Section 1409, and that has a similar review requirement um, for projects that receive state funds or permits or licenses. And so that's where you know, we have some meaning for what that is, uh, what, what these two uh, registered designations might mean for Oakwood Cemetery. Um, if I could have the next slide. So um, one thing that could happen, I think, with the administration building is um, if there Sorry, were- Rachel, the slide disappeared on that. Oh, okay. Um, just to say that if there were an income producing uh, uh, purpose um, for say the administration building, um, if you could turn it into some other kind of use like a cafe or some other kind of thing, some, uh, uh, I don't know, a flower shop um, for the cemetery, um, gardens, um, then that rehabilitation uh, project potentially could uh, apply for the 20% um, tax credit project. Um, here we have the historic chapel that was designed by Silsby. Um, and uh, this actually did receive a grant for restoration in 1991. So after the uh, National Register nomination was completed, they were awarded this grant um, but then that uh, never moved forward at that time. So um, you see the different ways in which um, the designation can benefit the cemetery. And so John now will um, tell us about the local historic designations, city of Syracuse designations and the, the preservation ordinances as it relates to Oakwood. Thanks Rachel. Yeah, the local landmark designation really is quite different from the state and national register designations because um, the local at the it's really at the local level where there's some um, regulation about what happens on the cemetery property. The, the push for a landmark preservation ordinance in Syracuse traces back to the loss of significant parts of the city through urban renewal, highway construction, and redevelopment beginning in the 1950s, really around the same time that the National Historic Preservation Act um, was being considered. In this photo of downtown Syracuse, most of the 15th Ward neighborhood had been demolished, and many significant individual landmarks were lost as the city tried to adapt to different models of urban development. 
The threatened loss of the Landmark Theater, which you may know on South Salina Street, in the early 1970s spurred citizens to enact a landmark preservation law. Syracuse's Landmark Preservation Ordinance was passed in 1975, so nine years after the federal law. It was created as part of the city's zoning ordinance that requires property owners to obtain city approval before making substantial changes. Along with conformity to zoning districts and building codes, the city now had to ensure that historic preservation was taken into account for locally designated historic properties. Just like the uh, federal law outlined some purposes of the law, so too did the Syracuse ordinance. And the wording of this is really that it to foster cultural, economic, and civic benefits. On the cultural side, these included designating historic districts and individual sites to identify, preserve, and interpret the city's rich artistic, architectural, and cultural achievements. On the economic side, the city's intent included improving property values, supporting tourism, and stimulating business and industry. In the civic realm, the preservation ordinance was intended to foster pride in Syracuse and protect the city's unique identity and its built environment. The Landmark Preservation Board was established to carry out the provisions of the Landmark Preservation Ordinance. These included designating sites and reviewing proposed changes to properties. The City Planning Commission and Common Council retained the right of final approval. The Landmark Theater was the first designated property in 1975. Oakwood Cemetery was designated in 1990, um, really a, a place of equal lavishness in terms of its historic details. And that was really around the same time that the National Register nomination was underway. Oakwood was one of the first large landscapes to be designated by the city. Since then, there have been many others and all are living actively used places such as Thorndon Park east of the university. Or the Berkeley Park Preservation District directly east of Oakwood Cemetery, a neighborhood that is actively lived in and used. Oakwood Cemetery was designated through the efforts of the Heritage Coalition, a regional preservation advocacy group that no longer exists, and the historic Oakwood Cemetery Preservation Association, then identified as the Friends of Oakwood Cemetery. Oakwood Cemetery submitted the application to the city, so the owners of the cemetery were in support of it. A public hearing was held and the Syracuse Common Council voted to approve the designation on October 30th, 1990. The documentation for the local protected site designation is largely the same as the National Register, including the boundaries. The ordinance did specify that day-to-day -day routine operations of the cemetery were not subject to review by the Landmark Preservation Board, but major additions and changes to historic features were. Vegetation was not addressed really due to the limited understanding of landscape preservation at that time. When an owner is planning a change to their designated property, they are required to submit what is called a Certificate of Appropriateness application to the Landmark Preservation Board. The board can approve the plans as submitted, request revisions, or deny the application. There is an appeals process, which is usually undertaken due to issues of economic hardship. As the ordinance is now written, consideration of economic hardship is made by the City Planning Commission. While the Landmark Preservation Board has certain powers, it also serves as a source of technical assistance and encouragement for property owners to make informed decisions about their historic properties. In the big picture, this project review process is intended to preserve the city's historic resources, to avoid the whims of property owners and managers who may not have a long-term stake in the properties and not share preservation ethic. 
To secure a certificate of appropriateness, property owners need to submit their proposed plans, documentation of existing conditions, and any relevant history, such as whether they are removing certain historic features. The board's threshold for review is when a property owner makes, quote, a material change of appearance, something that will alter how the property looks. For specific guidance, the board follows the National Park Service's guidelines, as secretary, known as the Secretary of the Interior Standards for the Treatment of Historic Properties, which we'll address in a subsequent preservation, uh, presentation. A recent example of a certificate of appropriateness was for a redesign of the landmark theater marquee intended to bring back its original character while also allowing for use of modern signage. The application included a historic photo at left, current documentation of the um, revised marquee that went up in the 50s, and a plan or rendering of the proposed changes at right. And the Landmark Preservation Board approved this change. So what kind of activities at Oakwood would require the input of the City Landmark Preservation Board? As Rachel mentioned, really when we get to dealing with landscapes, things get a little complex. Let's look at what kind of activities may require the board's review. One good example are individual buildings. And they are probably what most people think about when they think of preservation at Oakwood. They are discrete, manageable resources. So if a chapel restoration happens in the future, that might include putting back windows, replacing the roof, installing front doors, the cemetery would need to consult with the Landmark Preservation Board. The board would give advice about the appropriateness of the changes and either approve, request revisions, or deny the application. Oakwood's smaller buildings and structures also come, come under the purview of the Landmark Preservation Board. HACPA, the Historic Oakwood Preservation Association, recently did some terrific work on the Shipman Mausoleum pictured here by installing iron gates to prevent vandalism that was occurring inside. The Landmark Preservation Board would certainly have approved this addition, which is in keeping with the historic character of the building. But when you think about it, if a less sympathetic proposal had come before the board, such as blocking up the entrance with concrete, the Landmark Preservation Board would likely have asked for different alternatives to be explored. For the work that the ESF Friends of Oakwood does in the cemetery, most of the activities would not require a Landmark Preservation Board because most of it is about maintenance. Um, and that main, routine maintenance it does not require a certificate of appropriateness. So this could include work such as pruning, clearing brush, writing down grave markers, and removing volunteer vegetation. Note that all this work would still need approval of the Oakwood Cemetery owners. And note to who? Friends. Some other work that the Friends undertake, such as unearthing the Hoyt Circle curbing last fall, should be reviewed by the Landmark Preservation Board. The board would probably support this effort, but might want documentation on the historic condition and more information about whether the unearthing would impact drainage or the adjacent historic roadways. Oakwood's road system is one of its character defining features. Um, projects that remove or block historic circulation are reviewable actions. Pictured here is Woodside Avenue to the left of the Civil War burial area. And that was closed and blocked a number of years ago. The removal of this road has altered the historic boundaries and symmetry of the Civil War military plot. The Landmark Preservation Board might have recommended an alternative approach. And even small scale features such as signs can pose a material change of appearance to an historic landscape. The new section markers pictured here are an example of a new feature in the landscape that would recur require some review. Vegetation is one of the most complex uh, features in the landscape to think about preserving because as Rachel mentioned, they're a natural feature that is continually growing and changing. 
So we really need to think about vegetation in terms of cycles of growth and decline and how you keep those features in a consistent way over that life cycle. Um, such a, an example of this is the historic tulip poplar LA along Tulip Avenue at Wright. Um, so if one of these trees were to come down, um, you know, need to be taken down, that is something that the board would wanna look at. Also new plantings of trees can also uh, affect the historic character of the cemetery and should be considered. There are certain aspects of cultural landscapes that are less apparent as manageable resources, such as spaces or outdoor rooms. Creating a new burial area, such as the Islamic section near the chapel pictured here, is something the Landmark Preservation Board should have considered for its impact on the historic plan and layout of the cemetery. Views are another less apparent characteristic of the Oakwood landscape, um, something that you, know, you really can't directly manage. Um, this is a view from the Sumner plot that historically took in downtown and the lake beyond. The construction of ESF's Centennial Hall, while not on Oakwood property, had a major impact on the character of the landscape. The, landscape, the Landmark Preservation Board does take into consideration changes on properties adjacent to designated historic sites. Uncontrolled changes such as graffiti is obviously not something planned, but it's an indicator of ongoing stewardship or lack thereof that the Landmark Preservation Board is concerned about and could assist the cemetery with possible solutions such as selecting a remover that is safe for the historic limestone. Ongoing material changes that result from neglect are also something the Landmark Preservation Board needs to address. If the cemetery's plans are to let the historic office building collapse due to a lack of maintenance, then this is a violation of the, letter, of the spirit of the Landmark Preservation Ordinance. Obviously there are many complex issues behind it, um, but they need to be discussed. So this ends our presentation. Uh, if you put a question in the chat, we'll try to answer it now in the short time remaining, or if you'd also like to unmute yourself and uh, ask a question, we'd be happy to address that in that format as well. <laughs>